Hello YouTube friends, Ben Ochart here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today I want to talk with you about myths. There are myths that circulate around the aquarium hobby and these myths sometimes can be very destructive and uh, really in some cases deadly in the keeping of fish. So let's go ahead and get into it. These are some deadly myths in the fish keeping hobby. The first one I want to talk with you about is the idea that's been circulating around for years of one inch per gallon. Uh, you've heard that before, one inch per gallon. When you go to buy fish, what do you suggest? One inch per gallon. And I think the problem with that is, I mean, you probably could get away, let's say, with, uh, with 10 one inch fish in a 10 gallon tank. That probably would be okay, uh, assuming that they never change. But if, but if they're going to be growing, What's going to happen eventually is you're going to end up with a problem. So when you go to buy fish, forget about the one inch per gallon rule. What you do is you ask the person there, assuming they know, or you take your phone with, you know, with internet access and Google it and find out what, what is the size that these fish are going to get to. Because you will find, let's say you buy three or four Venusis, or, or trouts like this guy here, <laughs> and you, you put them into a 10 gallon tank, you're gonna end up with a, with a real big problem. So you know, get on Google. If it's cichlid you're looking at, go to Cichlid Forum. Uh, if you're an ACA member, American Cichlid Asso uh, Association, uh, you can go ahead to their website. There are a lot of sites out there where you can actually uh, get information about fish and, and what size they're going to get to. So uh, forget about one inch per gallon. Ask yourself, what's the size of this fish in six months to a year and a half to two years? And uh, the, other, uh, the other idea that I see floating around uh, is, is the idea that your, your pH must match the native habitat of the fish that you're buying. Uh, there's a couple cases that people have made against that and the first one is that very often the fish that we're buying are you know many 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 generations removed from their original habitat they've been you know they've been actually aquarium bred for quite some time and have acclimated to whatever the local water uh, water source is this is an advantage to buying from local breeders because they're probably, there's a good chance they're going to be on the same water source you're on. But uh, the acclimation process, allowing a fish to acclimate to what is going to be the day in, day out pH is going to be in the long run, I, I think. This is my opinion. Everything I state on my channel is my opinion. Keep that in mind. But I think that is going to be a lot better for your fish than you chasing uh, pH, like I talked about in a prior video, stop chasing pH and adding, you know, putting in aquarium additives, trying to figure out uh, how much to put in based on how much water you've removed and, and uh, using products like pH up, pH down, things like that, uh, which can actually create shifts that are a bit uh, too abrupt and that can be very stressful on a fish. In my opinion, if you're interested in having a certain kind of pH, Add things to the aquarium, in particular to the decor, of course. You can also do it inside the filter. Add things that are going to, or that are known for regulating pH. You can add some um, aragonite, let's say. Some people will put aragonite uh, as a substrate, which will add minerals, will help to buffer the tank, help to keep the pH up and stable. Limestone, uh, holy rock, uh, in this case here, crushed coral, shells, things of this nature. They can help with pH. Uh, you want to bring that pH down, uh, put some driftwood in there. Uh, that can help. So there's, there's, there's ways of doing it naturally that will occur slowly and gradually over time and that's a lot less stressful for your fish. Uh, the next one is the idea that you have to have the most expensive biomedia that's available. I like some of this biomedia that's out there. I'm a fan of Biohome, you know that. I, I think Marine Pure makes a great product. 
Uh, so there are some, some products out there that I like and that are a little bit costly. At the same time, do I, do I feel that it's absolutely necessary? No. You, if you're just getting into the hobby, if you are on a tight budget and, it's, and you have to choose between not being in the hobby or, or because you can't afford it, because the media is too expensive, or being in the hobby and using alternatives. I would prefer that you be in the hobby and use alternatives. Al alternatives like, like, like sponges. You could fill a filter entirely with sponges and you would be okay. A lot of that, bio, a lot of that beneficial bacteria is gonna be on the decor, the rocks, the, you know, the, the 3D background. I mean, this, this, this decor here holds a tremendous amount of beneficial bacteria. And if you're vacuuming lightly on the surface and not digging in too deep, you're not going to really disturb it that much. So a lot of your beneficial bacteria is going to be on other surfaces. Your sponges, give them a light rinse in tank water once a month. If you have three or four sponges, uh, let's say you have four of them, rinse two and leave two alone. Next time you service the, the uh, filter, rinse the other two and leave the other two alone. Rotate the, uh, the rinsing of the sponges within the filter. So there's, there's a lot of workarounds. You don't need to have the most expensive biomedia. It's not necessary. The other, the other uh, myth I want to talk with you about is food is food. Some people will just say, well, look, fish food is fish food. We trust the companies. They do a good job. Don't worry about it. Uh, the truth is, is that unfortunately, uh, food out there can contain uh, fillers and can contain things that do really no, no benefit to the fish and can actually cloud up your tank. So when you're buying food, and again, there's a budget consideration, I get it. Uh, for example, let's say you wanna buy Sarah, it's S-E-R-A, Sarah, out of Germany. A very highly researched food, very expensive. That might not fit your budget. So if you can't get Sarah, maybe try some Northfin. You can't get Northfin, try some of the cobalt uh, cobalt products. There are good products out there that are not full of fillers. Do a little bit of research. Go on some of the blogs and websites. Look at what people are saying. What's their before and after report? Did their fish look better after they started using that food? Did their tank cloud up and stay cloud up, clouded up? I mean, if, you're, if your tank clouds up for a little bit and then, and then clears up, you're okay. You don't have to worry about it. I mean, that, that can be normal. I used... Uh, I think it was Ron's or Rod's or there's a company that makes pellets. They're, they they make uh, algae pellets. You put them in the tank. The tank looks trashed for about 20 minutes and then it clears up. And the fish love them and they, and they get some good uh, healthy uh, algae in their system. So research your food. Get the get the best food that your budget can can afford. Okay, that's what I suggest. The number five, the, the fifth uh, myth I'm, I'm going to uh, talk with you about is, and, and I know this might be different for, for some of you salt, saltwater uh, fish keepers out there, for example, acclimating certain kinds of fish or corals, let's say, you might, you might need to, and it might be recommended or proven to be the better way to do drip, uh, uh, you know, drip acclimation. I do not use drip, and, and, and the only time I've had problems many, many years ago in adding new fish to a tank who then went into serious stress was when I was doing a drip acclimation. I was leaving that fish in that bag long, much longer than, than they needed to be and the real benefit is going to be when you get them out of the bag and get them into the tank. That's where they can really start to fully recover from being inside of this tightly enclosed space that's quickly accumulating ammonia and other junk. So um, I am what they call a, uh, a uh, flop and drop. I'm a flop and dropper. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that I, I float the bag for about 15 minutes or so, maybe a little longer. And then I, I simply pour the fish out uh, over a bucket through a net. So the net catches the fish, all the, the water in the bag goes into the bucket and then I gently put the fish into the tank. And I have never had a fish go into stress after doing a, uh, the, uh, flop, the flop and drop. 
If you go to Rachel O'Leary, Rachel O'Leary's uh, webpage, one of the folks that I trust on the internet, uh, does a lot of research, a lot of study. She talks about flop and drop. And uh, the last, the last thing I'll, I'll talk about. This is kind of a bonus tip because I promised you five, but you know me. I've got a sixth one for you. A little bonus tip. Uh, don't go crazy after you've set up a tank if the water is a little cloudy. That's normal. There are certain changes going on with the water. You have bacteria that is starting to, to form up. There may be some algae that's blooming. There's different things going on in a brand new tank that can cause some cloudiness. If you just let it run its course, it will actually clear up. I get a lot of messages. Hey, my tank, why isn't my tank clear? Why does your tank look so clear? Um, what's happening? Why? And then I ask more questions. Well, they set up the tank two weeks ago. It can be a month, it can be maybe two months, maybe three months, but you know what? It will pass and you'll have a nice, pristine, clear tank, but you have to be patient. It's not gonna be crystal clear uh, on day one, or it might be on day one, but then on, on the end of the second week, you're gonna find yourself with some cloudiness. Now, if you want to attack that problem head on, and you wanna, you wanna get it cleared up, because it's bothering the heck out of you and you can't take it, uh, be patient. But if patience is not in your makeup, do water changes. You can do some water changes, maybe after a little while, after the tank has cycled and you're getting zero ammonia, zero nitrite, and maybe between 10 and 30 nitrate. Uh, go ahead, do water change. You can use uh, crib batting, untreated, uh, poly, uh, polyfill crib batting. You can pick it up at any any store, any fabric store. Uh, be sure it's untreated. In other words, not heat retardant. You don't want it to have any kind of chemicals in it. Uh, you can throw some of that in your filter. You can also use products like Purigen. Uh, Boyd Enterprises makes uh, Chemi Pure. If you have plants, use Chemi Green. Uh, you can use uh, Pristine or Clarity made by Seachem, these are liquid products you can add. They bond to whatever's floating in your tank so that it's larger and now gets caught by the filter. So there are some products you can use to help speed up the process. But uh, don't go crazy if you have a cloudy tank right after setting it up. Realize it's normal, it will pass, and you'll have eventually, with patience, you will have, and, and staying on your maintenance schedule, you will have a pristine floating in air tank, okay? So those are my five plus one bonus tip of uh, myths that uh, float around that may or may not be true. Some can be, some can be deadly. Some can be very annoying. All right. What myths uh, have you heard? Share them below in the comments. I want to hear what, what, uh, which ones you've come across that you discovered, uh, either you knew right away or you discovered later were just myths. And uh, we all learn from each other on this channel, so share it in the comments below. And uh, I hope to see you on Saturday at Cichlids and Coffee, where we will talk more about uh, these topics and a lot more. All right? Thank you for tuning in. You are very appreciated. And I hope to see you next time.